Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. My name is Laura Kovacs, and tonight I have the honor of introducing Louise Erdrich. Ms. Erdrich last visited the Free Library with the Roundhouse, her riveting story of a boy seeking justice and understanding. A month later, she would add the National Book Award to the raft of awards that includes the National Book Critics Circle Award for Love Medicine, the Library of Congress Prize in American Fiction, the prestigious Penn Saul Bellow Award, and the Dayton Literary Peace Prize. In her novels, children's stories, nonfiction works, and poetry collections, she re revisits the beloved and familiar reservation of her North Dakota childhood and illuminates the mythical and magical in the detail of the everyday. Her new novel is an unforgettable contemporary story of a tragic accident, a call for justice, and a profound act of penance. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Louise Erdrich. Thank you all for being here tonight. It's just a pleasure to be back here again. And it's wonderful to be among book people. Still a few people are getting seated. Thank you for that lovely introduction, and also thank you, Bobby, for being security. It's back there. So this is the book that I'm, I'm out on a book tour, so this is very fortuitous. And this book, yeah, um, this book, I've, I've been writing it for a long time. It, it comes out of something that my mother told me. She told me this two-line story. The story was about a neighbor of hers on the Turtle Mountain Reservation. She said that this neighbor had been responsible for the death of the child of a friend and had given this person his own child to raise. So that's the, pr the beginning premise of the story. Now, it's, it's sort of made me gasp in a way, but in a way I also understood it very well. Because I grew up with a grandmother and a mother who adopted children in any time there was a trouble in another family. Um, sometimes uh, children would be given to grandparents, so the grandparents could raise the children in the old traditions. And there are all sorts of adoptions that don't really occur so often off of, uh, out of native culture. The boundaries between families and extended families and sisters and brothers and children were much more fluid. And in this case, the two men, the two fathers, the bereaved one and the one responsible, are best friends. Their sons were best friends. And the wives are sisters or half-sisters, but in Ojibwe, everybody's a sister if you're in the family. So the, the ties are very close. So when this happens, the question is, you know, I had to get this, I wasn't planning on writing this book. I, had pr I, don't, I, don't, I didn't want to write that beginning, but I found in spite of myself, that I had written it. But then I was relieved because I thought, the real story here is then what is made of this unthinkable, unspeakable tragedy? And how do these two families function? And is there healing? And what does this, this act of, of, of um, it was wonderful. She, uh, she, Laura called it a profound act of penance or something like that, a penance. We were talking about being Catholic. As, <laughs> so that's where that came from probably, but I've never heard it exactly called that, but that's what it is. So what does that do? Well, I'm going to write, I'm going to read a, a piece of, uh, of the narrative that involves the boy. The boy's only five when he's first given. So he's at that kind of magical age where he's halfway between that magical world of, of, of thinking that everything um, talks to him and, 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 and really just being that he's a sweet person, very sweet. And, and, and he's, 
sent to this family and he has a si he gains another sister he's already got two sisters he gains another sister and she is a piece of work <laughs> maggie and i loved writing maggie i felt i knew maggie very well and perhaps i'd even been maggie in some ways so this is going to be about maggie about and, and as it opens up she has uh, she has beaten up a kid who bullied her new brother, LaRose. LaRose is his name. And in retaliation, of course, the boy and his friends and his, all their families are out to get her any way they can. And this continues on. The first part is in 1999, and the second part is in 2003, or this is actually the beginning of 2000, then it moves forward to 2003, when she becomes adopted into the other family. So they, they have a series of kind of adoptions that go back and forth. This is how it works. And it, it, it works out through some, some very painful times, but what interested me was how this was going to work with these people. So Maggie, after Maggie drop kicked du Dougie Vetter, that's what she did. <coughs> she actually knocked him out. Dougie had an older brother, and his whole family wanted to get her. And Dougie's friends, and uh, even a sister named Braylon. Tyler Vetter. Curtin's Peace, Brad Morrissey, and Jason Buggy Wildstrand tried to call themselves the Fearsome Four. Until later, it never caught on except as a joke, because at present they were skinny and soft and hadn't got their growth. Mainly, they played video games and fooled around with Curtin's guitars left to him by his brother. They had a songbook but didn't know what the markings meant or how to tune their instruments. Their noise was good, they thought. Dougie told his brother how Maggie had tried murder on him. Tyler told his friends, and they kept their eyes out for the right chance to get her. Nothing happened. After school, she always took the bus. And then, because she got a part as a singing mushroom <laughs> in a play and had to stay after, she had to be picked up. One day, they lucked out because her mother was late. Maggie was walking in a circle, fuming, kicking up leaves. It was cold, clammy, and wet outside. She didn't like it. Tyler came by and said in a nice voice, You okay? He was that much older, she didn't recognize him. No, said Maggie, my mom's late. We live over there. He pointed at the garage where the fearsome four hung out. Me and my bros. You want to come home, hang out till your mom gets here? You can see from the side window. I don't know, Maggie said. My mom's there. OK. She followed him to the garage, and they went inside. There were Tyler's friends. They stood around awkwardly. Then Tyler said, want to sit on the couch? As soon as Maggie sat down, she knew this was bad. They jammed in beside her, pinning her. And Tyler said, you tried to kill Dougie. Then he and the other boys started putting their hands all over her. They dogpiled her, their grubby paws pinching and prodding. She had a fainting feeling, like she was weak and drained of all her strength. A floating grief came over her like a soft veil. Her head buzzed, but the boy's hands moved still harder and a hot burn hit her gut. She shrieked. When Tyler tried to cover her mouth, she bit down on his finger until she tasted blood. Buggy pushed her back into the cushions, and she screamed louder, slammed her knees into his crotch so hard he yipped and howled like a puppy. Curtains tried to keep a hold, but her thumbs went out and jabbed his eyeballs. He fell back, yelling, blinded, and she jumped toward a guitar, swung it up against Brad's face. She knocked him against the wall. He curled his arms around his head. Buggy was curled in the corner, bawling. Brad was wheezing. They were all in trauma. <laughs> boys, boys, 
You hungry? Their mother out the back door. Nah, called Tyler. The boys, except for Buggy, still curled on the floor, stood panting, staring at each other in a circle. Finally, Tyler said, Fuck, that was amazing. <laughs> hey, Maggie, we need a front man. We need a girl. Want to join our band? <laughs> join? Maggie tossed her hair, inching backward, straightened her clothes. Adrenaline was wearing off, and common fright was telling her to find the door. We'll tell if you don't join, said Tyler. We'll say you wanted it. She stepped to the door and opened it. Rage whirled around her like a burning hula hoop. Tell? Tell? Go ahead. You know Landro, who killed my brother? Well, he's my stepfather now. He'll hunt every one of you down. He'll shoot your heads off. Bye. <laughs> Maggie ran back to a corner where she was supposed to meet her mother. The car was pulling up. Oh, sorry I was late, honey. Did you get bored? Shut up, said Maggie. Shut up? Shut up. Is that any way? Shut up. Shut up. Shut up, Maggie shrieked. She ran straight into the house and into her room and slammed the door. After a while, she sneaked out to the bathroom, and then in the hallway, La Rose came up behind her. Quit following me around, brat, Maggie said. Her head felt funny, like what those boys sucked her brains out. Their touching hands were gross and left germs of stupidness. She wanted to wash and wash. But she couldn't hold on to the bitchiness. The rose was so frustrating, melting her with nothing particular except he never hurt anything. It got dark early, so Maggie and LaRose went down to see if there was food, and they ate some ice cream. Maggie poured a can of Dad's beer into the dog's water bowl. <laughs> he walked over and sniffed suspiciously, but the smell was good. He lapped it up. She poured him another one. <laughs> he liked that one, too. Then he got a smashed look on his face, walked head on, into the closed glass doors and fell over. <laughs> La Rose slid open the doors and helped the dog outside. Poor stupid dog, said Maggie. The dog walked in circles and fell off the deck. La Rose sat down in the cold grass with him and cradled its head in his lap. The dog was panting, his eyes were glassy, but his snarl could have been a smile. Maggie sat shivering on the deck looking down. The dog whimpered, a drunk dog whimper. You need coffee, said La Rose. <laughs> the dog didn't move. Slobber dripped until the dog's breath bubbled all over La Rose's hands and legs. Maggie watched, admiring La Rose because of the way he let the dog slobber on him. And he was always like that. There was a way he always captured spiders and never squashed them, and calmed hens before they had to be killed and saved bats, and observed but never drowned hills of ants, and he brought stunned birds to life. Nola, said Grace before dinner. A thought nagged at Maggie. She looked at La Rose, who was studying his food. He was like that monk in the brown robe, Francis. The animals came to La Rose and laid themselves down at his feet. They were drawn to him, knowing they would be saved. This thought was erased by the way her mother chewed. Actually, it was everything about the way her mother ate. She was already furious with her mother for being late, for putting her life in danger from those maggots. Maggie tried to turn away to pretend her mother did not exist. But she couldn't have watch. Nola poured poked her fork into one green bean, then raised it to her mouth. Oh, sometimes Nola would look around the table to see if anyone else in the family was eating a green bean at the exact same time. At this moment, she was alone with her bean. Nola caught her daughter's look of contempt. Surprised, she opened her mouth, bared her lips, and snatched the green bean off the end of the fork with her teeth. Maggie whipped her head back. How could she? How on this earth? The teeth, 
the teeth scraping the fork, the metal on enamel click. Maggie felt a sodden roar rising. She stared down at her plate at the green beans and tried to counsel her hatred to get behind her like Satan, as hunky old father Travis had suggested when her mother dragged her to confession that one time. She took a deep breath and she picked up one green bean with her fingers. Nobody noticed it. It took six hand-plucked green beans, a casual, hey, hey, mom, then a provocative mad flare of her eyes as she chomped green beans off her fingers, then the freakish grin that always got a rise. Nola sat back, her fork half raised. She emitted a blistering wave of force. This is how you eat a bean, Maggie, she said. And she lifted the fork, bared her lips, scraped the bean off the fork with her teeth. Maggie looked straight at her and mouthed words that only Nola, only her mother could see. You are disgusting. What's happening? cried her father, Peter, feeling the soundless screech, missing the lip sync. The dog dry heaved in the corner. <laughs> LaRose took the bowl and scooped the last of the green beans onto his plate and ate them fast. He glanced over, worried, but the dog had quietly passed out. <laughs> Nola's face darkened. She was panting hard now with the shut-ups added to the you are disgusting. Maggie leaned her chair back, satisfied. She excused herself and sauntered up the stairs. Nola's eyes followed her daughter soured death rays. She had raised a monster whom she hated with all the black oils of her heart, but whom she also loved with a deadly, confused despair. Quietly, sinking back into her chair, she experimentally ate a green bean off the end of her fork. Nobody noticed, so it wasn't her. She was not disgusting. A tear dropped on her Maggie slipped into LaRose's room that night. She'd been lying in her room, cooling off after another hot, hot shower. She'd started to cry all alone, but cut off the crying quickly as she could to toughen herself because she was a wolf, a wounded wolf. She'd sink her teeth in those boys' throats. Her thoughts returned to how the animals were drawn to LaRose. She would trust her paw to his boy hand. Move over, she whispered and popped under his quilt, her hot feet on his shins. I gotta ask you something. Her nose was still plugged by the unwilled crying. Her face was swollen, but his skin cooled the soles of her feet. Please, LaRose, don't laugh. I'm going to ask you something serious. Okay. What would you do if boys jump me, if they touch me and stuff? all over in a bad way. I would make them die, said LaRose. Do you think you could? <laughs> I would figure it out. Could a saint kill for love? Saints have superpowers, said LaRose. You think you're a saint? No. I think you are, said Maggie. She rolled over, stared at the crack of dim light underneath the door. It was a cool night. The warmth of him suffused the bed. The itchy, dirty, cootie-fingered film on her skin dispersed. The roiling craziness her mother caused with her chewing habits dissipated. Everything bad was drawn into the gentle magnetism of the bed sheets. She began to drift. LaRose stroked the ends of her hair on the pillow beside him. I'm a broken animal, she whispered. Oh, Maggie, Maggie. <laughs> well, LaRose's sisters, Snow and Josette, I I really enjoyed them. <coughs> Excuse me.
Does anybody else have to cough? We can all cough together. <laughs> it's so damp out, you know. <clears throat> so they have the sisters really bring Maggie into their girl world. You know, they they just pick her up as a sister, and she loves it, and she loves them, and um, she's younger. They're a couple years older, but they get her onto the school volleyball team. So this is where it's a volleyball game. I'm going to read, yes, I'm going to read you about a girls' volleyball game. <laughs> volleyball is so cool. I'm going to read it to you. And in this game, so much weird healing happens. I mean, in a kind of violent way, it does. But uh, at one point, you'll know and you'll understand that Maggie feels her mother's love for her in a rather extreme way. So volleyball, really cool all through the, I don't know if it's cool here, it's really cool through the Midwest. And it's not like, you know, it used to be played sort of pickup, backyard, blah, blah, blah. It's really, really full of rules. And girls are just, um, you know, they're, they're out for the kill. And each point is a kill. So it, it's really something. The wars. The Pluto boys were already the planets, so the Pluto girls were called the lady planets. And you know, I didn't use the team I really wanted to use, which was the lady bulldogs. It's a volleyball team out in North Dakota. Anyway, their colors were purple and white, and their mascot was a round planet with legs, arms, and a perky face. The reservation team was the warriors, but the girls weren't the lady warriors, they were just the warriors also. Their colors were blue and gold, and they didn't want to have themselves as a mascot, so they had an old-time shield with eagle feathers, and this was printed onto their uniform. The volleyball shirts were close-fitting nylon, long sleeve for hitting balls on their forearms, and they wore tight shorts and knee pads. Coach Duke, made them wear headbands and ponytails because no matter how disciplined they were, girls still got distracted and touched their hair. The girls had come to idolize Coach Duke and his mingy ponytail. The Warriors had won every game of the season, except their first game with the Pluto planets. The nights turned cold and colder, and suddenly the Warriors were 8-1 with a grudge. Tonight, they were playing the Pluto team again and ready to win. I don't like that they call scores kills, said Nola. Nothing should die. Peter took her hand. Nothing dies, said Peter. It's just a word. They were crushed into the stands, parent knees in their backs, parent backs against their knees. Nola had packed a small padded cooler with sandwiches and cold pop, and she'd even bought green grapes, so expensive this time of year. Peter helped her take her coat off or lower it anyway. There was no place to put it, so she wrapped the puffy sleeves around her waist. The gym was stuffy, and there was only one stand, so the parents of the opposing teams had to sit together. They tried to group themselves according to the team they'd come to support, but inadvertently mixed. The teams warmed up, doing stretches, then a pepper drill, pass, set, spike, pass, set, spike, and next each player jumped and spiked the ball off the coach's toss. At last, both teams got court time to practice serves. The Warriors' strategy was to look weak to the Pluto team and even pretend to argue. Maggie, hissed Joe, set, you awake? Invisible wink, elaborate pout by Maggie, lots of ball smacking, no smiles at each other, and then the girls lined up. She's so small, Nola whispered, always struck by the contrast between Maggie and her teammates. And the planets are, Peter caught himself, he was going to say massive and planetary. They were big, solid, formidable girls, and Maggie had told them to watch for Buggy's sister, Braylon. I see her, said Nola loud, loudly, the harsh eyeliner. 
Peter put his arm around her and spoke low in her ear. Remember the other parents? He hadn't seen Braylon's parents for a while, but was pretty sure they were behind them. Oh, Nola pulled an imaginary zipper across her lips. Snow and Josette's parents came in and found a place to sit and wedged in with groups of warrior parents. And the warriors saluted first the parents, then the coach, then passed the opposing team, fake touching hands through the net and saying, good luck to every planet. Good luck, good luck, good, good luck, good luck. You wanted it. You wanted it, said Braylon to Maggie with a smile pasted on her face. She passed swiftly, looking straight ahead. Did you hear it? Snow had been directly behind Maggie. Hear what? <sighs> you wanted it, thought Maggie. Buggy had told his sister. Shake it off. Maggie had a little thing she did, a shimmy to get rid of a bad feeling or failed hit, kind of an invisible, instantaneous, all over shake. Josette knew it and saw it, though. The team made a circle and put their arms around each other. Coach Duke stood, holding his clipboard, in one hand, and the other sliced the air with each deliberate sentence. He told them volleyball was just a game, just a game except for right now, when it was more than a game. He reminded them about relaxed intensity, focus, bold acts, take their time setting up spikes, stay loose, keep focus. They were a family, sisters, warriors, who would beat this team, restoring honor. Stop everything except being right here, right now, he said, and use your voice, call the ball, and slap hands out there, and stay positive. Diamond was team captain. She looked at each one of them in turn, and they silently rose and put three fingers in the air, and everybody thought they were pointing to the Holy Trinity. But it was their special move, W for warriors. And they roared, warriors, 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 and jumped high and smacked hands. Josette was first up to serve. She loved the moment when the team slung off its false girly vagueness and became a machine. Rock that serve, baby! Josette's mom's voice was then consumed with the other parent voices. Josette flew up and bashed it. But one of the brutal red-headed planet twins, Gwenna, caught it on one forearm. A miss hit, but a setter managed to play it, and Braylon boomed it down the seam. Snow nonchalantly lobbed it, diamond set with a precise fingertip pass to Regina, and that was that. Regina could drop a ball on a dime, an actual dime. For fun, they'd set up shots for her, 20 dimes on the floor. She kept everyone she hit and made $2. <laughs> a medium blonde named Crystal, pretty, a planet, twisted to return Josette's next serve and shanked. So it went. Josette got six serves in before the planets called timeout. They'll blast back now, said Coach, Coach Duke. Maggie, you're our secret weapon. They haven't tested you, so be ready. Josette, they will try to get your next serve if it kills them, so give them heck. Regina, if you get a chance, don't say it, Coach. Take a dump, said Diamond. Let's call it your surprise left-hand attack, okay? And everyone remember, an assist is as good as a kill. Maggie didn't think so. After each game, she totaled her kills on a piece of paper taped to her bedroom wall. The scorekeepers added them up, too. And if a girl reached 1,000, she got a foot-high golden trophy. And Maggie wanted one. Newspaper headline, Girl of 1,000 Kills. She had developed her jump to ballerina height and perfected a sliding tip, the merest tap, never a push, a deflection of trajectory that sometimes happened so quickly it was uncanny. She could score without remembering how the ball came at her. Sometimes she'd even feel its shadow and think the shadow off her hand onto the floor of the opposing court. When she was rotated into the hitter's position up front, the other team always wanted to show the tiny girl what. With her slippery, eccentric, high leap blocks and tips, Maggie got to show them what. 
Josette's serving surf was upset by the interruption as the planet's coach had intended, and Maggie felt the energy on the court shift. The warriors crouched, pep-talking one another, passing it around, call it, call it, call it, call it, so they remember to use their voices. Braylon was at serve. Square-shouldered, chubby-jawed, goth-eyed. She didn't look at Maggie or seem to aim at her, but Maggie was ready anyway. Braylon got an ace off her. The ball had hesitated. Bra Maggie could swear and change direction. She flushed. But once she knew Braylon's trick, she could handle it. She watched the ball come off the heel of Braylon's hand this time and saw where it would break. Maggie was there, but the ball wasn't. That was two points, back-to-back -back aces. The planet parents were shouting. Her parents were tense and silent. Maggie shimmery, shimmied all over <clears throat> and stepped back into the game. She kept her eyes on the serve and pried a weak rescue off the floor, something Josette on her knees could put into play for Diamond. But the planets returned the shot, and there began a long, bitter, hard-fought, manic volley with miracle saves and unlikely hits tamed into dinky, waddle-rolling blurps off the top of the net that drove the parents nuts. They leaped up, gasping, yelling, but it was friendly pandemonium. By the time Regina finally won a joust with Crystal, everyone was in a good mood, except Crystal, who hissed at Regina, a startin' freckled, freckled cat. Regina turned away and said, freaky. The players bounced into formation, and although the Warriors continued their five or six point lead, they fought hard for it. Luck was with them in close calls, causing a few planet parents to grumble. The Warriors took the first two games. Then the planets bore, bore down and the, the luck went their way. So did the next two games. And now the tiebreaker fifth game was on. Most volleyball games were competitive but affable, everyone straining toward good sportsmanship. Coach Duke had even sent home a code of conduct that the player and her parents had to sign. But during the fourth game, there had been hard hits, harder looks, a few jeering yells, smug high fives on points, and by the fifth game, an ugly electricity had infected the gym. Nola knew which parent was for which team. There was no placatory murmur, nice hit, when the opposing team scored a point. No friendly banter anymore. But Nola had yelled hard, but held back her glee as the coach's flyer had counseled when the other team faulted. She had tried not to contest line hits, tried not to call out when she thought she knew better than the player where the ball would strike. She had tried, as coach begged, not to dishonor the game of volleyball. Nola surreptitiously ate a grape. Oh, it was disappointing. Tough, tasteless, watery. She tried another. Maggie didn't always serve, but the coach did not remove her from the lineup. Suddenly, there she was, up. The Warriors had lost the first two points. This serve had to stop the planet's momentum. The pressure. Why, Maggie? Peter shouted encouragement, but Nola was silent. She stared hard at her daughter, trying to pass luck into her by force of love. Maggie served into the net. Desolate, her mother threw her hands into her lap like empty gloves. The planet parents with the knobby knees and the ravages backs, Braylon's parents, the wild strands, cackled in pleasure. Peter caught Nola as she turned, put his arm around her, don't go there, honey, he said into her hair. The warriors were relaxed and intent on the next serve. Coach had directed them to breathe from the gut and high-five every play even if it ended in a lost point. His philosophy was based on developing what he called team mind meld. But Nola only saw that Maggie was now 
stuck right in the line of fire. A sob of anxiety caught in Noah's chest, but a buttery warmth now spread across Maggie's shoulders. Maggie looked so small and vulnerable with her sylph frame and spindle legs. She could have been standing on the court alone. She crouched, arms out. Crystal served straight to her, and Maggie set for Regina's surprise left dump. Point. Next serve from Snow. The other redhead burned the ball down Maggie's left, but Maggie flipped underneath and socked it high. Josette assisted Diamond, who landed a swift spike. Another point. Another tie. Braylon stepped up and flared her vixen fury eyes. Maggie's stomach boiled. Braylon slammed the ball twice on the floor, impassive and stony mad. With a flick of power, she sent Maggie her booby trap special. It was supposed to break just over Maggie's head and land behind her. But Maggie knew Braylon's arm now, and with a surge of exuberance lifted off her feet, she swerved, spiked the ball into the donut. Kill! Nola had been standing the whole time. A parent nudged Peter, and he tried to pull her down. Kill! She screamed into a spot of silence. Kill! 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 Maggie heard it, and the butter swirled down around her heart. Peter tightened his arm around Nola's shoulder and whispered in her ear, but she was someplace else. And this oddly filled him with relief, because this was not fake or unreal. There was no hidden meaning. This was the Nola he knew, not the super smiley one. This was the family dynamic, not the manufactured happy family with no aggravation, no anger, no loud voices, no pain allowed where he felt so alone. He was for sure not alone now because Nola was going batshit. <laughs> Sit the goddamn hell down. It was the woman behind her. Nola heard that command with a grape in her cheek. She turned, opened her mouth to give a dignified piece of her mind, and out it flew exactly like a glob of green spit, <laughs> landing on the mother's broad pink nose. A shocked pause. The father lifted himself, squarish, bear-like man with sloping shoulders, a walrus mustache, a trucker hat that said, Dakota, sand, and gravel. He put his arms out to shove Nola down, but having perfected her move, she leaned forward and popped her breast into his grip. <laughs> Trekker hat yelped. Get your paws off me, shrieked Nola. Peter saw only the hands. Mrs. Trucker hat was still wiping grape off her face when Peter let his fist fly. Oh, it felt so good to let the rage out. Then instant remorse as Trucker hat bent over, face in hands. Nola, however, went numb with pleasure. The game was stopped, and the thin, apprehensive science teacher was forced to extract four parents from the stands. <laughs> Nola dreamily slid out, clinging tight to Peter's arm. Both failed to see that their daughter had blazed a beanball straight at Braylon as the whistle sounded to stop play. Distracted. Braylon let down her guard and sustained a facial. Now her nose was bleeding all over the floor. The referee held up a yellow card and went out and out went Maggie to the booze of planet moms and dads. The planets, hearts blistering, played with vengeant energy, but lost control, faulted, missed easy returns tried for nasty cut shots without the setup, and lost by eight points. The Warriors high-fived it and made a subdued exit. It didn't feel exactly good, like a win. It felt like something bigger and darker had just played out. 
They didn't know the half of it, thought Maggie, still quiet with joy at the sight of Braylon's blood on the floor. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh. oh, okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. I, Thank you. If this is not too nosy, I wondered if you have a regular daily schedule that you observe, a ritual of work. Oh, gosh, you're so polite because everyone just goes, do you have a daily schedule? <laughs> you just are so polite. Thank you. Um, I try to have one, yes. I try to keep, you know, daily hours. Uh, I bring my daughter to, my daughter is a freshman in high school. I try to bring her, you know, I bring her to um, school and then I try to do something, walk my dog or, you know, get my head, sort of wake, wake myself up. And then I get more coffee and see if the coffee works. I sit down and see if the coffee does anything. As long as I can, yeah. For the kids to be adopted into the various families, does that impact their psyche? Yes, yes. And so for LaRose and for the other, for the other children, you know, I think in this case, there's an, understand, an underlying understanding that they're doing something to bring their family, their family honor back in a way, if that makes sense. So they have this commitment, but a five-year-old doesn't know that. So the older kids know that, but they're still angry. They're still angry. The five-year-old, he is completely he absolutely feels abandoned at first. He doesn't know what's happening. And what happens is that the father of the, the, the father of the boy who was killed finally decides, look, we have to, we have to do something else. I can't bear what's his, his bewilderment. And even though Maggie steps in to take care of him, you know, and the mother is so immediately so bonded to this little boy even though they are bonded to him, he still doesn't know where his, why he's not going back to his, 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 his real parents. He doesn't know. Because he used to come over to your, here, there to play, but suddenly his playmate is gone and he's living there, right? And he, they keep telling him, but he doesn't understand it. He's only five. But he's a special kid. And he, not only does the father, as I was saying, the father decide that we have to share him he has to be, we all have to be basically one family, which was what would have happened traditionally. There was so much adoption when Native people lost family members. You know, in the first, first hundreds of years, nine out of every 10 Native person would die in a community of disease, of warfare, of, of, of diff but mostly of disease, and then of, of all sorts of different different reasons. So there, what happened was adoption allowed people to cobble together their tribes and their nations, right? So adoption had a lot, has a long history and a very different history with Native American people. So in this case, this was a traditional way of maintaining some sort of healing within, with this unspeakable tragic accident. But, of course, how do you explain that to a child? But he becomes, in a way, he understands that he's been given this huge responsibility as he begins to grow up. He becomes really a sort of hero to his family. And everyone knows about him. He is a special person. I have him sort of his, there's five La Roses in the book, and he's the fifth generation, and he's a boy. And they say it takes five generations or four generations to heal trauma. So he's like the resilient one who comes along just in time to really save this situation. You, you speak so lovingly about your characters. Can you speak to, the, to your relationship with your characters both while you're writing a book and after the conclusion? Oh, well, obviously still, uh, you know, I have this, sense of LaRose, I didn't know what was going to happen at first, you know, whether he would be able to 
stay with them or be able to bear this, you know? But as I wrote him, um, I thought of children, I, I was very bonded with all these characters. They, they really meant so, so much to me, it was hard to put them down. Um, he reminded me of my daughter's kindergarten students. And she teaches in inner city kindergartens. She's taught in inner city, city um, neighborhoods and schools. <clears throat> and now she teaches on the Lakutare Reservation in Wisconsin in an Ojibwe immersion school. But especially when she taught in Minneapolis, she would, I, I got to know her kids and I would find amazing children who would do anything for their families, and it just, it just completely tore me apart to see how hard their lives were and how hard they worked to be responsible, some of these kids, these wonderful kids. And they just wanted their parents to be okay so badly, and their parents weren't okay. So yeah, I, I have enormous affection for the characters. They also remind me of some real kids. And of course, the volleyball players remind you me of real kids. the rose as a penance. And I think of a penance as being between <coughs> an individual and their spiritual leader, God or whoever that is. Mm. And I'm hearing the rose more as a reparation, hearing repair and the unifying effect of repairing something that's torn asunder. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it, the dynamic is two-way. I, I think you're right. That makes that that's a good word, because he really is. It's um, well, you hear a lot of a lot about restorative justice, and in this case, uh, this is the third of a trilogy of books about justice, and what it is, it really amounts to an act of traditional justice that's carried out in contemporary life. And I, I really did want to explore if that could work. I don't know if it really can, and I decided to, to try finding out what it would look like for these two families to have to contend with such a thing. Hi. Hi. How important are the names of your characters, and how do you go about choosing those names? You know, the names are everything. It is interesting. I, I had... I had such trouble because Nola's name was originally Lorena, and I wrote her as Lorena the whole time, and I, and then I have a, one of my best friends, her, one of her good friends is named Lorena, and I thought, oh my God, Lorena will think that I'm writing about her, and I could, I had to find another name, but I still think of Nola as Lorena. You know, I really get attached to their names, and LaRose is a name that goes way back in our family genealogy. And I don't know the exact relationship, but uh, I just loved that name and I'd thought about it for so long. And I knew it was going to be a title. I just didn't know how and who would be La Rose. But there's other La Roses in the book. It goes back to 1839. Yeah. There was a story in the New Yorker that was about a girl called the flower and she was la rose she's the f original la rose and you can find that if you're interested in just seeing these pieces in here as a story uh, i have an unfair question for you oh, an unfair question yeah. is being asked uh, okay what happens to maggie when she grows up is she going to be a novelist <laughs> Well, she doesn't, you don't see her growing up in the book, but, <laughs> but I think she's got everything. I think she's got everything she needs. And, um, you know, if you read the book, I think you can make your own decision. <laughs> How's that for an unfair answer? First, I want to thank you for the pleasure I've had in reading many of your books, particularly the one you wrote the year after your daughter was born. Thank you. Is that oh the my. daughter who's now a teacher? Oh, so that's the daughter. This 
This um, cover, she, she made this cover, and she's making all my book covers now. Really? Roundhouse, all, all of the recent book yeah. covers. So this cover is my uh, grandfather's handwriting, his Indian boarding school taught handwriting. Oh, wow. My grandfather on my mother's side went to uh, an, a U.S. government Indian boarding school, and you had to learn mm. immaculate script, mm. just like in Catholic schools. They taught, the, the government taught this too. So this is his, she took letters out of um, letters that he wrote and she made this cover. So um, she's the one who was just born when I wrote yes. The Blue Jays Dance. You're think, that's yes, the one you're talking that about. Yes, it was yeah. wonderful. We, um, that wasn't my question, but I just wanted to thank you because I remember <laughs> reading it uh, not that long after one of my children was born and it oh. just was a great pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Um, y y it sounded the way you were talking that your books are not carefully plotted before you sit down, that you start with an idea and then it gets inside your head and goes from there. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about that pr process? Well, this one I kept approaching from different angles and it was different. Um, the Roundhouse, for instance, I pretty much knew that it was going to be a very plotted book and it was all plotted out before I wrote it. It had to be because it was about jurisdiction on native land, so I had to make it into a kind of um, thriller, psychological and mystery thriller, so that people would read about jurisdiction. You know, it wasn't something you'd just pick up. Oh, jurisdiction, I can't wait. <laughs> you know. But it, so it, it depends on the book. Sometimes I know and sometimes I really don't know. Uh, I would like to hear you talk a little bit more about the importance of the individual in Euro-American culture versus the importance of the community in Native American culture. And it sounds to me like that's informing this story a great deal. Mm. Oh, that's a, wow. <laughs> Whew, okay. Um, good question. <laughs> Giant question, right? Um, no, I think we're. I think we see and we know that we have this kind of cult of the in individual in in um, our Western life, and it's not to say that there isn't a leadership and certain people don't stand out in Native culture too. That's very true, but as in the case of uh, you know an extended family. There is a very, I, I find there is a very different sense of community and family. I mean, I would never think, I live close to my sisters. We live within the same three block radius and my children live by me. I mean, we really live close together and my other um, siblings have kind of gravitated toward my, where my parents live in North Dakota. And I find we really, we really make our own little, little, um, yeah, we make our own little balls of people <laughs> somehow. Um, but I don't know if that's unique to us. Uh, my mother is um, Ojibwe and French, and my dad is German. I mean, he's just as much like that. He's just, uh, he's, he's one of those, um, wow, they used to call him a very, uh, he was an he's an interesting man, he's 90 now, but He's just an intellectual force. He's the main literary influence on my life, me and my mother. Well, with that, I don't know if I've answered your question at all, um, because I, that's a, that's a broad topic. Maybe we can all talk about it, and we, we're going to go up and what? Um, I'll sign books, talk further along. And again, thank you. Thank you for coming. It's a great pleasure. Great pleasure to be here. Thank you.